this morning, um, I want to begin by putting a metaphor into your mind, if that's okay, and hopefully it's one that you're all familiar with. Uh, has everybody watched the Olympic Games when you have the Olympic torch relay that happens leading up to the Games? It's this incredible scene, and, and just describing for you what happens in case you're not familiar, um, in Greece they light a fire, right? They light this fire and then they uh, put their torch into the fire and then a runner goes and carries this torch and goes and, and this, this relay goes around the world to different countries and different places. And of course, it's not the same runner doing the entire race. One runner jumps up and grabs a torch for a season and then when the next runner comes, they, they bring their torches together and the, the baton is passed as the next flame is lit and the next runner begins. And sometimes there's a few runners, sometimes there's one runner, but this journey goes all around the world and it's preparing people for the coming of the Olympics. It's kind of rallying everybody. It's reminding them it's about to come, it's happening. So these messengers with these torches and flames run all around the world until they finally arrive. And you have that special opening ceremony when then the big cauldron is lit and raised up. It's an incredible um, tradition that's part of the Olympics. And as I was reflecting on that metaphor, it just struck me as being um, an apt metaphor for as we're talking about mission and what Jesus has commissioned us to do. And I want you to think about it like this, that you know, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, Jesus died and rose again. He, kinda, he lit a spiritual flame in Jerusalem in that time and place. Something happened there. And then Jesus passes on his mission to his disciples. So Acts 1.8, he says, Go and be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit's coming. Sorry, I'll fix this up. The Holy Spirit is coming, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so the Holy Spirit empowers them. And thinking about the picture of tongues of fire, this, this picture of batons, and it's like their torches are lit, and they go out on mission to the ends of the earth, spreading the gospel, announcing the coming of the kingdom of God. You see, that's kind of what the mission is. It's a picture for us of the mission that, that Jesus is handing on to us at the moment, that you and I, we're like torchbearers in that relay race, carrying a torch, a spark of the kingdom. And it's our calling to go out and announce God's kingdom is actually here in our midst. It's both here and it's coming. It's both end. And so we are sent as runners all throughout the earth. One person lighting another person's torch and a flame and passing on and spreading, announcing what God is up to. You see, Jesus has actually handed on his mission to you and I. The baton has been passed. And for some of us, that's a bit of a daunting thing, isn't it? Sometimes it's an exciting thing. But what I want you to do just for a moment is turn to somebody that you've come with today or somebody next to you and just tell them, what's your first reaction to the thought that Jesus would entrust his mission to you? Have a chat. All right. Curious to know, is anyone brave enough to throw out some initial reactions? What, what's a reaction that comes to mind for you when you think about Jesus entrusting his mission to you? What's some reactions? Scary? Scary? Yeah. Yep. I hear that. What else? Pardon? Frightened? Yep. Who, me? Who, me? <laughs> <Yeah>. Someone else? <laughs> yeah. What else? Any other reactions to that? Excited. Excited. Yeah. Yeah, excited for what that could, the implications of that. Any other reactions? Any thoughts? Chosen. chosen. Mm, a real sense of being chosen. It's good. <laughs> and what? And that's stupid. Why are you giving that to me? <laughs> I certainly resonate with some of that. <laughs> and this morning, even just with that, you can see a whole spectrum of responses, right? From, ah, who, me? Like, why would you entrust that to me? To a bit of shock and awe of going, wow, God, would you really trust that? Something so significant into my hands? You know, I'm, I'm often comforted by, uh, it's 2 Corinthians 12. I haven't put it up on the screen. 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where God says to Paul, my power is made perfect in weakness. And I hold on to that sometimes because the thought of God handing his mission over to me, over to us, I go, well, God, I'm, I'm weak. I don't know if I'm entirely capable of doing what you did. But the Bible promises that his power is made perfect in our weakness. See, what I want you to hear as we start this message today is that I don't actually think Jesus would entrust his mission to us if he didn't think we were capable of running with it. Right? Wouldn't that just be ludicrous if the God of the universe handed his mission over to somebody who couldn't handle it? I think of it like this. like When I want to get a babysitter for my kids, 
I'm meticulous on who that person is. <laughs> I don't just let anybody babysit my kids when I go out. I want to make sure that the person I entrust them to is capable. Why? Because I love my kids. I want to look after them. And the same is true, I believe, with the, with the mission that Jesus calls us to. His mission is to reach a lost world, broken people, people that he cares about so deeply. And I believe that if he's handing his mission over to us, it's actually because he believes we can go, we can do it, not by our own strength, because you and I will be the first ones to say, we are weak, we are not capable, we are not ready. But it's through the empowerment of his spirit with us that gives us what we need to go for him. And so what I want to say to you this morning is, the question is not, can we go on mission for Jesus? The question is, will you go on mission? It's not can you, because God is with us. We've sung that this morning. God is with us. He's given us his spirit. He's given us gifts. He promises to act on our behalf. So it's not that can we do it, but will we go? Will we go on mission for Jesus? You see, this morning, we're kind of pivoting as we bring uh, this term's teaching series. And the last few weeks, we've been going through this harvest series. We spent three weeks talking about the ways that the harvest is plentiful. And Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we've talked about the missional potential that is before us, all of the opportunities that God might have. We've talked about what God can do with the little that we have to offer him. The fishes and the loaves, remember that? That if we're just willing to give him what's in our hands, what he can do and what he can multiply. And then last week, we, st- we talked about the harvest in the next generation, the potential and the significance of passing the gospel on to the next generation below us. But today we go to a next part of this series called Send Me. And we're staying in the same teaching passage, the same concept for this term, but we're now shifting the focus a bit away from the potential and now towards the conversations of the workers. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers a few. So what does it mean to be a worker in the kingdom? And what could it look like to be said of our church that the harvest was plentiful and the workers were ready? I wonder if that could be said of our church that the workers were ready or that the workers were nowhere to be found because they were in the harvest field about their father's business. And so today we, we start this send me aspect of this teaching series. And so to do that, I want to jump into the same passage we've been reading, but I want to read on just a little bit further for us now to start to build the picture. And this is Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. And this is what it says. And by the way, I'm reading this in a different translation to the last few weeks, because when you sit in a passage in the same translation for too long, you tend to switch off. So this is now in the New Living Translation. Let's have a read of this. It says, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, or in NIV we said plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Let's stop there. There's so much more to this passage, but you see this first bit where Jesus says, the harvest is great, it's plentiful, there's all these potential. But then he says, the workers are few. The workers are few. That's the problem we have to wrestle with here is that there are more potential um, for the kingdom of God than there are people willing to go and chase after that potential. And so Jesus tells us what to do. He gives us two instructions here, and I want to highlight them for you on this next slide. He said the first thing here is to ask him to send more workers, right? If the workers are few, there's two things to do. He says, ask the Lord, the Lord of the harvest, to send more workers. So that's a prayer request, right? I want to pray for more resource, pray for more people to be raised up. But then the second thing he says, he says, now go. He speaks to you and I. He speaks to his disciples. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest for more workers. But now you go and you be a part of the harvest. Two things we can do. Now, I suspect for a lot of us, we're probably more comfortable with one of these things than the other. And for a lot of us, I think we err on the side of this first one. We see all that God needs to do in our communities, right? We might look and go, there's a youth ministry that has no leaders. So God, would you please raise up somebody to go and lead at that youth ministry? 
Or we move into a new neighborhood and we meet all our neighbors and we go, God, would you send somebody to just share with them the gospel so that these people could know you? And I think sometimes God is scratching his head going, I, I, don't you, you've misunderstood. I did send somebody. It's you. <laughs> I put you in that neighborhood so that they may know who I am. And here we are praying for somebody else, right? God, please send somebody else. That's often how we pray. We feel more comfortable asking the Lord to send out more workers. But the interesting thing here is Jesus doesn't stop at the prayer request. He says, now you go. And he kind of gives us some frightening instructions. We'll look at in a tick. But he says, now you go. Now, please understand, you and I, we don't answer prayers. God is the one who answers prayers. But he actually invites us to be part of the answer to our own prayer, doesn't he? He asks us to pray for workers and then to participate by going as a worker. You see, when we ask for provision, we're learning to depend on him. We're recognizing that it's his harvest. He sends the workers. He provides. That's what that prayer does for us. We realize the need around us and we depend on him. But by going, we're actually putting our faith into action, choosing to trust him by taking a step of faith and saying, would you use me? Would you send me as a worker into the field? You see, I believe that for some of us, we have been asking God, but not going. We've been asking God to send somebody else, but we haven't been prepared to actually go ourselves, to take a step of faith, to say, God, where would you use me? How could you use me to step into something that might stretch us or even scare us? For some of us, we've been asking so that we don't have to go. We've been praying. God, I've been praying. Why don't you send somebody? And in our heart of hearts, we go, I don't have to go because I've been praying. And for some of us, I think some of us, we just go gung-ho, don't we? We jump into things and we say yes to everything, but we don't necessarily depend on God's provision. We don't take the time to ask him, what does he want to do? How is he going to provide? And so I wonder, where have you been asking but not going? Or where have you been going but not asking? In this passage, Jesus invites us to do both. But today, I'm just going to focus on one of these two things. And uh, I'm going to focus on the going aspect. And there's two reasons for that. First is I think most of us struggle more with the going than the asking. So I'm going to trust that your prayer life, you can pray for more workers. But also in this passage, Jesus spends the rest of his time unpacking what it means to go on mission. So if Jesus chooses that as his focus, I think that's the focus that you and I need to look at, look at here. So let's talk about that. What does it mean to go into the harvest, to go as a worker in the kingdom? And as we heard before, as we shared our initial reactions, a lot of us struggle with the idea of taking that torch of, of going for Jesus with his mission. And in many ways, I think we write ourselves off. We go, you know what? I'm no good at talking. Or I don't have the answers to share with anybody. Or nobody respects me. Why would they listen to me? Or I'm too old. Or I'm too young. Or I'm too busy. Or whatever it is. We, we come up with these excuses to write ourselves off, don't we? And we go, you know what? God would probably want to use someone better than me. Someone more qualified or more prepared or more experienced. And so we write ourselves off and say, Jesus, I'm going to spare you the embarrassment of having me as a worker for you. I'm going to let you use somebody else. But I want to draw your attention back to this passage and look now at verse 3. We're just going to look at this next bit. And if you go to the next slide, I've highlighted it for us. Jesus says, now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Now get this, Jesus says, I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Does that sound exciting? <laughs> I mean, let, me, let me just ask you this. Does a lamb stand any chance in a battle against a wolf? And let's not over-spiritualize this, all right? Like, let's be real. A lamb versus a wolf. The lamb is going to get eaten every single time, right? And Jesus says, here's my strategy to spread my gospel across the world. I'm going to send you out just like a lamb, a little lamb, with the wolves. That, to me, does not sound like good strategy. But actually cuts to the core of our insecurities. Because I think for a lot of us, we go, well, I'm no good. I'm not ready. I can't do this. And Jesus is saying, I know. You're a little lamb. And they're wolves. And I'm sending you, the little lamb, out to the wolves. And so when we write ourselves off and we say, well, I can't do this, 
That is the point. The point is by your own strength and accomplishments, you probably can't do this because you are a lamb amongst wolves. But by the power of the Spirit of God who is alive in you, you are capable of going and spreading the gospel. So Jesus sends us out like lambs among wolves. And then he makes it worse, right? Then he says, don't take anything with you, right? No bag, no sandals, no suitcase. Don't take anything with you. And I think for a lot of us, we just think, look, if I just had some time to get ready and prepare to go on mission with Jesus, then I'd be good to go. Like, give me a year at Bible college, then I'll be good to go. Or give me a special course. I may just need to read the latest book. Once I've done that, then I'll be ready to go. And here's Jesus saying, you know what? Nothing you could prepare in advance is going to help you here. Leave it all behind. Leave all your provisions. Leave all the things that you are depending on and leaning on. Leave that at home because everything you need can be found in me as you go. And as I read that, I think it just, I think it speaks to all of us here that wrestle with our doubts about whether God could use us. Because he's saying, you are a little lamb sending you out with no preparations, but you can trust me. I go with you. My spirit empowers you. You know, if you think that you couldn't do what God is calling you to do, then you're actually in good company when you open up the Word of God. Do you know that? <laughs> you're in really good company. I want to show you a few examples. And we'll bring this up. Here is a couple of examples of leaders and prophets in the Old Testament um, who thought that they couldn't do what God was asking them to do. And the first one here is Moses. And if you know the story of Moses, God calls him to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt, um, out towards the promised land. And Moses has about four or five excuses here. And I've just paraphrased them because they're, they're a bit lengthy, but I think all of us have probably said this at one point. I don't have the ability. I don't know what to say. I don't have authority or position. I'm not a good speaker. <laughs> I love when, when Moses says that, God says, don't worry, I'll give you Aaron, your brother. He can speak for you. In other words, there's no excuses you can make. <laughs> and I think for a lot of us, we resonate with some of what Moses is saying here. And in fact, I didn't put this up, but in Exodus uh, 4.13, Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> Please send someone else. I think a lot of us pray that, don't we? Lord, this is too uncomfortable. This is too difficult. I can't do this. Please send someone else. That's Moses. What about Gideon? He's one of the, uh, the judges in the Old Testament. And God comes to him and asks him to lead a military campaign. And uh, Gideon goes, I can't because my clan is the weakest and I am the least. In other words, I'm the lowest of the low in this society. Who's going to come with me? What do I know about wielding a sword? Why would you want to use me for a military campaign? But God says, I'm sending you. Jeremiah, he has a terrible job. He has to preach to a bunch of people that aren't going to listen to him. Right? I hope that's not the case in this church. I think I've got a better job. People listen to me sometimes here. But poor Jeremiah, he had to preach to people that wouldn't respond. And he says, I don't know how to speak. He's a bit like Moses. And he says, I'm too young. He thinks his age is a limitation. Well, then there's Jonah. Everyone loves Jonah, don't they? <laughs> Jonah, who the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, go this way. So Jonah goes that way. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, of their enemies at the time, who are an atrocious enemy. He didn't want them to be forgiven, and he was afraid of what they might do to him. So he runs the other direction. I wonder if any of these prophets or leaders resonate with you. I wonder if there's any of these excuses that you have held in your heart, and you've said to God, I can't do what you're asking me to do because of that. Uh, 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 uh. I think if we're honest, all of us have said this to God. We've felt these things in our heart. And yet these are the people that God has chosen throughout his story and throughout history to represent him and to carry his mission to the nations. I want to read you something from the New Testament that I think is encouraging. And it's a reminder that God likes to use people who are weak. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. He says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. And as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. 
this passage is a reminder that God loves to use people who are weak, who are broken, who feel inadequate. They're the people that God chose. That's me. That's you. I jokingly say I'm a fool for Christ. You want to know why? My job contract began on April 1st, 2019. (laughs) I am a fool for Christ. (laughs) Maybe you are too. God doesn't choose strong people, capable people. He chooses people that are humbled before him, that actually through their weaknesses, that his strength can be shown. And I actually think it's more dangerous to go on mission for Jesus thinking you've got it all, thinking that you are God's gift to humanity. You're one step away from a fall if that's what you have in your mind. But you see, in my life, there has been so many times when God has called me to go for Him. And I tell you what, at every one of those points, I have felt completely inadequate. I have carried so many doubts. And I just want to share a couple with you so you kind of understand that there's nothing super spiritual going on here. Like, there are just as many doubts and frustrations in me as there probably are in you. I remember when I was a teenager, I grew up in this church, and uh, one of our previous senior pastors at the time, I would have been year 10, year 11, he came to me before church and said, hey, can I get you to stand up during my sermon? I want to use some people as like visual representations of like the disciples. I'm going, oh yeah, cool, like I can stand up. Anyways, he gets them to stand up one at a time, and this one represents Matthew and Mark, or, well, not Mark, but you know, Luke or Goodness, I'm getting my disciples mixed up. Terrible. Anyways, he gets them to stand up as one of the key disciples. And then he gets to the Apostle Paul, and he asks me to stand up. And uh, he gets me just here in the front, and he stands me up and makes me face the congregation, and he puts his hands on my shoulders, and he starts speaking over me about how I could be like an Apostle Paul, about how God's calling me and inviting me to go. And I remember thinking, why would God want to use me like... I'm in year 10. I've got more pimples than anybody else. (laughs) Who's going to listen to me? What do I know? I'm standing in a room full of adults. Why would God want to send me? But I remember that moment. I remember that sense of commissioning. And nothing really happened in the moment, but I look back on that now and go, wow, God was already speaking something over my life then, but I thought I couldn't do it. Fast forward a few years, I'm living in Foster on the mid-north coast and trying to figure out, do I come to Campbelltown? Am I called to move here? And uh, God often speaks to me in dreams. And I, I had this incredible dream where my wife and I, we were like a domino piece. And you see a domino piece is like two numbers, right? So two people, one, one piece. So I had this, this dream that we were like a domino piece on the map of Australia. We were on Foster. And in my dream, this rushing wind came and pushed the domino piece from Foster over to Campbelltown. And um, i got to tell you, I woke up basically yelling and screaming. Like I, my wife thought I was a mad person. But I was this, this wind, it was terrifying, but it was also peaceful and empowering and exhilarating. And I just woke up saying to her, wherever God sends me, I will go. I will go where he sends me. And I knew in that moment he was calling me back here. But you see, I didn't, wanna, I didn't really want to come back initially because I was carrying some hurt from my time in Campbelltown. When I'd left, I'd, I'd laughed saying, I'm never coming back here again. But in God's wisdom, he brought healing to my life. And then he called me back. And even though I had all these doubts around whether it was wise, whether it was right to come back, I knew that he was calling me. So I said, okay, I'll come. And then in 2019, um, when our previous senior minister finished up, um, I was having all these God moments wrestling through, am I meant to put my hand up for this role? And uh, I went to a camp, and I think I've shared this story, but it was just such a profound moment for me. Went to this camp where we had an international speaker from the UK. He doesn't know me from a bar of soap. He's running a leadership seminar with about 100 leaders before we run this camp. And uh, partway through his message, he just stops. He kind of just like looks up. It's almost like there's a download (laughs) coming in. He stops and he looks around and he goes, God wants to talk to somebody here today. And then he proceeds to describe my scenario. You know, he goes, oh, there's someone here who God's given a leadership opportunity before them and you don't know whether you should take it or not take it. And he kind of lists off everything. And I'm, I'm like shaking. It's like there was fire in my bones because I knew what he was saying was for me. And no one's putting their hand up. And I knew I had, he's going, who is this person? Who is it? And so I had to put my hand up and say, it's me. And then he just spoke and he just encouraged me and prayed for me and his team prayed for me. And there was this sense that like God was just calling me out of the crowd saying, I have called you to go. But at that point, you know what my doubt was? I'm going, I think I'm too young. Like I'm only 31. Like, is that okay for me to step into a role like this? Like who's going to listen to me? But irrespective of my doubts, God was calling me. And so I knew that I had to say yes. 
So there's so many stories in my life of times that God has been calling me in every single one of them. I have had doubts about whether God could use me. And I still wrestle all the time with doubts around whether God is using me. That's a wrestle I have. And I'm sure it's a wrestle that you have as well. But you see, Jesus is handing you a mission. Like that Olympic torch, he has lit a flame and he's reaching out to you saying, will you take this? Will you go for me? Will you be a runner to the ends of the earth to announce the coming of the kingdom of God that is here in our midst? Will you go? Here's what I'll say to you. I'll put it on this next slide. God doesn't send us because of our strengths, but because our weaknesses reveal his strengths. Okay, when you hear that, God's not sending you because you're super gifted or super talented or God's gift to humanity. Jesus is God's gift to humanity. We are broken vessels, people who feel inadequate. But Jesus says, that's okay. I'm going to send you like a little lamb because in your weaknesses, I can be shown as being strong. God is calling you. He is commissioning you. He is sending you out into the harvest field. And the question is not, can you do it, but will you? Will you go for Jesus? And so in the passage we read today, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus gives us two things to do. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. Pray. And we need to be doing that. We need to be praying for more people, more resources, more provision. But we also need to be part of answering that prayer in taking a step to go to go for him. And that's going to look different for each and every one of us, right? No single one of us is responsible for every single aspect of God's mission, right? We all have a part to play. And what you do is going to be different to what I do, and it's going to be different to what people over here do. It doesn't matter what part we contribute. The point is, are we willing? When Jesus says go, when we know that he's calling us, will we actually say yes? And that could be about having conversations with people in your world. It's been nagging you for a while. I need to have a conversation with that person. It could be being more open about your faith in your school or your workplace or wherever it is that you go. Some of us, we're shy Christians and we hide that away. Maybe God's calling you to be a bit more of a light bearer in that situation. Maybe for some of you, God is calling you to a specific opportunity or a a role, or a ministry, or an activity. Maybe he's calling you to move house and move location to be around some different people. Maybe he's calling you to spend time hosting people, offering hospitality to somebody different. I don't know. It's going to look different for every single one of you. But are you willing to go? And that's the question I want to call us to today is, are we willing? When God says, will you go? Will we say, yes, send me. Don't just send somebody else, Lord. Send me. Use me because I want to be a part of what you're up to. I want to experience your faithfulness. I want to step out in faith and see what you do. So Jesus, send me. And for some of you, you're in the midst of that, aren't you? You've already said, send me. You're already in the trenches. You're already out there running with that flame. And maybe today it's a reaffirmation of what God has already called you to. A reminder that, yes, I am called, and yes, I have left, and there's no going back. I'm going to keep going forward for Jesus. So what I want to do now as we finish up is um, I just want to read you a scripture passage, and I might invite the band to come up, and uh, we're just going to have some ministry time. So the band are going to come up and just, just play a bit of music for us. And what I want to read to you is a passage out of Isaiah. And I just think this is a really fitting passage for us as we land this today. And as you listen to this, um, I want you to be thinking about this question, question of what is the mission or the harvest field that God is calling me into? What is the mission or the harvest field that God is calling me into? Let me read this to you. Isaiah chapter 6, this is his commissioning. He's one of these prophets that doesn't think that he can do what God is going to call him to do. Isaiah is having this profound moment. He has this vision that he's sitting before God's throne and he's realizing that he's broken and unworthy of being there. In fact, he thinks he's going to die. This is what he says in verse 5. It's not on the screen, but you can just listen to me. It says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, 
the Lord Almighty. So here he is grappling with his brokenness, his inadequacy. He's a man of unclean lips. He's, he's contaminated, he feels, by the world around him. And then in verse 6, then one of the seraphim, which was an angelic being, flew to, flew to him with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And when it touched my mouth and said, it said, See, this has taken, touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Isaiah has this profound moment where it's like God takes away his sin and his guilt. And it reminds me of what Jesus has done for us through the cross, through his death and his resurrection. He's taken away all our brokenness. He's actually taken away our impurities. We stand right before God because of what Jesus has done for us. So we're just like Isaiah here. And then this next bit, I love this next bit. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God poses the question, who will go? Who will go on mission for me? Who will carry that flame? And Isaiah is standing before him. And this is what he says. He says, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. And my hope and my prayer this morning is, is as the call goes out to say, who will go for Jesus today? That you and I, we would respond and say, here am I. Send me. And every time you think about your inadequacies or your brokenness or the things that are stopping you, you can remember that that is dealt with because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Jesus has made you right. And because of that, you are ready. You're ready to go. So will you go? Will you respond and say, send me, Lord? So just for a moment, I just want to give you a moment to reflect now. What is the mission or the harvest field that God is calling you to? Who are the people? Where is the place? What is the opportunity that God might be tugging on your heart for this year? Where have you been resisting Him? Where have you been saying, no, Lord, I won't do that? Just sit for a moment, reflect on that, and in a second we're going to pray. Where is your harvest field? While we're in this moment, I just want to pray for some people here. And uh, I just have a sense that there are people here that feel like they are inhibited from doing what God is calling them to do. Because maybe for you, you feel inadequate. Maybe you feel like you're not qualified. Maybe it's because of the things that somebody has said to you that you think you can't do it. Maybe it's because of the things that you've been saying to yourself. Is there anyone here who's brave enough to put up their hand and say, I need to be prayed for this morning. I need to be prayed for something that is stopping me from going for Jesus. If that's you, just put up your hand wherever you are. You can see one hand. Is there anyone else? Two hands. Thank you. Three. Yeah. Keep those hands up. Maybe for you, you just feel like you're going to fail, like you're going to let God down, like He couldn't possibly use you. Is that you this morning? Keep those hands up. I want to pray for you if that's you. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for every person that's boldly raised their hand this morning. And I pray that your spirit would just break into whatever is stopping them from going right now. And we pray that in Jesus' name, that any words that have been spoken over them would fall to the ground short. God, that any fears would actually be vanquished. Lord, I want to pray that you replace those things with your truth, with a courage and a boldness that comes only from you. And Lord, I want to pray for anybody here that feels that that is them, but just didn't feel like they could raise their hand. I want to pray for a freedom in their spirit, for a courage for them to go. Jesus, that you would use us, that you would call us, that you would send us. I pray this morning that we would just be like an army of saints that you are calling to send out, that we are going out today with that flame in hand to announce what you are doing in our lives and in the world around us. So I want to pray for a blessing on every person here, particularly those that have raised their hands. I pray for your voice to be clear and to be known. Pray for clarity. 
on where you are sending us and what you're calling us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.